grace and peace to you and welcome in the name of the Lord. You are welcome here if you are tuning in from nearby or far away. You are welcome here no matter who you love, what you look like, or where you live. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at the United Congregational Church of Little Compton. I'm so glad that you're here. I am returning from uh, two weeks of rest and I am so grateful for the time off. I wanna thank Bev Edwards and my father for both filling in and making that possible. And to all of the lay leaders who just jumped in and helped, I'm just so grateful. Uh, thank you so much for giving Alex and I this time of rest. Uh, it's great to be back. I'm excited to see that uh, Project Welcome has begun and the construction is happening and uh, you can see that we have uh, the back of the church being taken off to build our new accessible building um, and this is great news. So thank you all for your support. Friends, without any further ado, let us worship God. Friends, I invite you to gather in spirit with me as we pray. I invite you to breathe, to be present here, to open yourself to God's presence, to God's voice, to your call. Let us pray. Holy God, of mystery and mercy, you find us even in lonely exile, even in our darkest days, and you breathe your spirit into us. Come to us now, God, we pray. Restore and renew us. Enliven and empower us. Soothe and save us. That by your power we might stand with courage against violence, and work on behalf of all our brothers and sisters who are suffering from oppression and injustice. In a culture of selfishness and greed, let us be radically generous and humble of heart. We pray this in the name of the one who showed us the way to true life, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Exodus, chapter 1, verses 8 and 22. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor, They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, and they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Exodus 2, verses 1 to 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? 
Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. If we were to step back and look at our lives and see what we prioritize, what we spend our time on, what we spend our money on, what story would our lives tell about what we most value? And would the reality of our lives truly reflect the things we say are most important to us? This question has been sort of haunting me. And I try to pay attention to the things that haunt me because a mentor of mine taught me that haunting is one way that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and gets our attention. And so as I read today's scripture reading, that Holy Ghost continued to haunt me with that question about values. It turns out that this is a story about people who are forced to reckon with this very question. When faced with extraordinary circumstances, Every person in the story must choose which values they hold most dear. When push comes to shove, when lives are on the line, when power begins to be thrown around, what we do in those moments tells the story of what we value above all else. Our story begins with a new pharaoh in Egypt. This king the most powerful leader in his day, feels threatened by an immigrant population, the Hebrew people. They are a small ethnic minority who came to Egypt as refugees when a devastating drought drove them from their homeland. They have lived in peace alongside their neighbors for generations, ever since Joseph, their ancestor, famously helped the pharaoh of his day to save the Egyptian people from famine by inventing a clever system of grain storage. But apparently the new pharaoh doesn't remember this history. This pharaoh doesn't see the Hebrew people as neighbors, but as others, a potential threat to his power. After all, he notes, the Hebrew people are having babies at an alarming rate. What if they join with our enemies against us? He asks. And so this new pharaoh rounds up the Hebrew people and forces them into enslavement. Sometimes what reveals our values most is what we do when we come into a position of power. When we get a seat at the table, what do we advocate for? When we come into money, what do we do with it? When we rise to the top, do we use our power for the good of the whole or merely for our own gain? In the case of this pharaoh, it takes only four verses to see that what he values most is security and power for himself. He holds little value for the lives of the Hebrew people. He reduces them to mere assets who exist to do his bidding. He values them only for the profit they bring him with their free labor and the safety he imagines he is buying. The more that Pharaoh dehumanizes the Hebrews, the more he and the Egyptian people fear that they will rise up against them and demand retribution. The Egyptian government enacts harsher and harsher policies against the Hebrew people, becoming more and more ruthless until eventually, Pharaoh commands the midwives to take any baby boys away from their mothers at birth and kill them. The midwives of our story, Shipra and Pua, are Hebrew slaves tasked with delivering the babies of the kingdom. These two women are often held up as the first recorded examples of civil disobedience. They refuse to obey Pharaoh's command to kill the boy babies, even though this is risking their lives with each child they allow to live. Why? How are these women able to courageously defy the orders of Pharaoh, the dangerous leader of the most powerful nation in the world? It is as simple and as hard 
as this. They feared their God more than they feared the Pharaoh. Now, in this context, fear of the Lord is not a cowering fear as if they are afraid that God will punish them or torture them. Rather, fear of the Lord is a phrase that in Hebrew implies ordering one's life with God at the center. It is when your faith is paramount and everything else follows. It is akin to the phrase in English you may have heard used to describe a faithful person. She is a God-fearing woman. At its heart, the fear of the Lord is about grounding your decisions, your actions, the whole way you live in the moral laws of God above all else. The midwives fear the Lord. Their values are clear. The value of the life of a newborn baby boy born into slavery was more important to God than the fabricated national security threat that the Pharaoh claims these children pose. The women, called by God to be bearers of life, refuse to become bearers of death. They break the law that Pharaoh has made for the sake of the higher law of their God. They use their imaginations, their limited resources, to peacefully resist the violence and evil of their government. Not with swords, not with violence, not with hate, but by stubbornly insisting on protecting the lives of the most vulnerable, they sneak those baby boys into the arms of their mothers. They hide them from danger, protect them from harm, deliver them from evil. And when Pharaoh catches on, these midwives use his own stereotyped ideas against him. They say that the Hebrew women are more vigorous than the Egyptian women. They give birth before the midwife can even get there. And Pharaoh lacks the imagination to see that they are deceiving him with his own prejudiced assumptions. Into this world of danger and fear, Moses is born. Like the midwives, his mother risks her life and refuses to follow the decree from the Pharaoh. She hides Moses for three months until she can hide him no longer. Desperate and with no other options, she does the only thing she can think of. She lovingly builds him a tiny ark. She carefully lines it so it won't leak and gently places her baby in the river with a fervent prayer that someone downstream will have mercy on him and save his life. And so baby Moses takes the famous ride down the Nile River, which carries him to the very place where Pharaoh's daughter is bathing. There, Moses' mother's prayers are answered. The princess sees the baby and is moved with pity. She acknowledges that this is a Hebrew baby. She knows well the law that her father has decreed, but she follows a deeper law of the heart. In compassion, she rescues him, nurtures him, and eventually adopts him as her own child. Moses, who will grow to be the greatest prophet of the Hebrew people, Moses, who will return to Egypt at God's command to deliver his people from slavery. Moses, who with God's help will topple the tyrant Pharaoh and end his reign of cruelty and violence. He only survives to do any of that because of the courageous resistance and faith of his birth mother, who valued his life above her own, and the defiant compassion of his adoptive mother, the Pharaoh's daughter who could see the God-given value of this tiny immigrant child's life and choose to love, care, and protect him, rather than be swayed by the fear-mongering and dehumanizing policies of her father. My friends, I have been thinking this week about values. When push comes to shove and lives are on the line, would I have found the courage and moral clarity of those midwives to risk my own life, my own safety to defend the helpless victims before me? Would I have found the courage and compassion of Pharaoh's daughter 
to adopt an abandoned refugee child who washed up on the shores near my home? I wonder, if I had lived in our young nation in the early 1800s and someone fleeing slavery had knocked at my door, would I have taken them in and sheltered them, hidden them, given them the chance of living free? Would I have broken the laws of my nation in order to follow the laws of human decency demanded by my God? I wonder, if I lived in Germany during the rise of the Nazis to power, would I have resisted Hitler's enticing promise of economic prosperity and national pride? Would I have spoken out against the rhetoric and the policies that increasingly dehumanize the Jews, the Catholics, the Social Democrats, those with disabilities? I wonder, in the era of civil rights, would I have dared to go and get into what statesman John Lewis called good trouble, peacefully marching for equality, resisting the laws that attempted to enshrine segregation, refusing to resort to violence even in the face of violence. I hope, I hope that I would have risen to the occasion in every case. But my friends, it is easy to adjudicate the values of people in the past. It is easy to ask, how could they have been bystanders? How could anyone have been silent? Especially those who claim to follow Christ. But history reveals a difficult truth. The vast majority of Christians supported the enslavement of African and indigenous people in our nation. Two of the pastors of our own church here in Little Compton were slave owners. The vast majority of Christians in Germany during the 1930s settled for the uneasy safety and prosperity for their families at the expense of the violent dehumanization and eventual genocide of minorities. And the rise of white supremacy in our nation in the wake of the Civil War was firmly rooted in white Christianity. Those who donned hoods and led lynch mobs and terrorized black families simultaneously claimed Christianity as their creed. This is certainly not to say that any of these things were Christian. Quite the contrary. Foundational to the Christian faith is God's decree that all human beings are made in God's image, that each life holds equal dignity and value in God's eyes, and that we, God's people, are to value all human beings with that same care and dignity as we would our own families. But what we know from our own experiences, what we know from history is that we do not always live up to our own values, especially when doing so requires us to resist the powers that be and sacrifice our own safety and security and peace. My friends, in every lifetime, there comes a test of our values a moment when push comes to shove and lives are on the line. And we are forced to come face to face with whether our professed values really line up with our lived values. And it's not easy. But my friends, I believe that as a society, we are in one of those moments. This is it. Our children and our grandchildren will study the year 2020. They will look back and they will see what we did and what we did not do. They will see the story of our values play out in how we are living our lives, the choices we make today. In the throes of a deadly pandemic that has killed nearly 200,000 of our fellow Americans, what did we do? Were we like Moses' mother willing to make sacrifices? of our own to save lives? Or were we like the many nameless Egyptians who went about their lives as normal while children were torn from their wailing mothers and thrown into the Nile? In the midst of a historic racial reckoning in which our nation has an opportunity to live into the best of its ideals, our children 
and our grandchildren will see what we did. Did we rise to the occasion like Pharaoh's daughter, to take whatever power and privilege we were born with, and use it to lift those who, by virtue of where they were born or what they look like, did not have access to the same life, liberty, and equality that we take for granted? Or did we, like so many of our fellow Christians throughout history, look the other way and decide, this is just how it is, better to take care of our own than worry about someone else's problems? And as we face the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression, what will they see that we did? What will our actions reveal about our values? Will we, like the midwives, take great risks to care for the most vulnerable? Will we simply focus our energy on survival, on making it through to live another day? My friends, this is it. As the beloved musical Hamilton says, history has its eye on you, on us. And I hope, I hope that we will be the Christians that the history books remember as the ones who stood for love, who sacrificed for equality and care for all people, who peacefully advocated for social justice and worked tirelessly for a better world for all of God's children. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, who finds a way where there seems to be no way, give us your eyes to see, not with fear or favor, but let us see as Jesus sees and love as Jesus loves. God, you hear the cries of your children bending under the weight of inequality and the cycles of poverty that we fail to notice or change. Do not let us withdraw from the world. Bring courage and compassion to our hearts. We pray especially today for all those in California who have been impacted by the terrible wildfires that continue to rage. God, be with all who are fighting the fires and all who are grieving the loss of home and the loss of life. We pray today for the people of Kenosha, Wisconsin, for Jacob Blake, who was shot seven times by police and is paralyzed. We pray for his three children who watched from the car. We pray for Kyle Rittenhouse the 17-year-old who showed up 
to the protests following Blake's death with an AR-15 and shot two peaceful protesters who were trying to disarm him. We pray for them, Anthony Huber, who died, and Joseph Rosenbaum, who was wounded. We pray for our nation, which continues to encourage violence as the answer and teaches our children that guns are an appropriate way to deal with conflict. Lord, have mercy. Bring healing, wisdom, compassion, and justice to the community. God, we pray for all who have been impacted by Hurricane Laura, for all whose homes and lives have been destroyed. Help us to come together as a nation and help them rebuild. God, who brought us together into this family of faith, we pray for each person in our congregation. We pray especially this day for the Hawes family as they grieve the loss of Barbara. And we pray for all those that we name now, either silently or aloud. God, with you all things are possible. Help us build your kingdom here on earth, a society where all are welcomed and none are turned away, where we are quick to forgive and slow to judge, where each has what they need and no one has too much. Give us imagination to see the world as it could be and the hope to work toward that possibility with faith in your power to change and transform. We pray in the name and in the presence of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today for worship. I'm so glad that you are here. I hope that you will join us following worship for coffee hour at 1030. Uh, we would love to see you via Zoom. It's always so wonderful to see people's faces um, in this time when we are socially distant. Um, I invite you to make your offering today. You can uh, give to your weekly offering or uh, donate to support our ministries on our homepage. Uh, and you can find the link wherever you found this video. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And now, may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace and love. Amen. Mm -hmm.